the city resonates with echoes from a magnificent past when it was called the imperial city and the navel of the world. When it was Constantinople, the noble capital of the Byzantine Empire. In the year 330 AD, Emperor Constantine moved the seat of his domain from Rome to the east to the small Greek town of Byzantium. Perched on the shores of Bosporus, overlooking the Asian coast across the water, it united two of the three continents on which the Byzantine Empire would expand during the millennium of its life. He called the city New Rome to underscore that this was a new and dynamic extension, while also a continuation of the invincible Roman state. Constantinople, renamed in honor of the first Christian emperor, went on to become the heart of the political, cultural, and religious life of the Byzantine Empire. Today, the city is Istanbul, a thriving metropolis in the modern Turkish state with a population of 8 million. As years have gone by, the complexion of the city has changed drastically. After the fall of Byzantium to the Ottoman Turks, the Christian population has continuously fled what was once the center of Greek Orthodox civilization. The vibrant Christian Orthodox community of Istanbul has withered from half a million in recent centuries to 100,000 by the 1920s to only 4,000 souls today. And yet, the city is still regarded as the center of a special universe by more than 200 million people around the world. According to early church tradition, Andrew, the brother of Peter, and himself the Protoklitos, the first called Apostle of Christ, was the founder of the local church in the ancient city of Byzantium. Over the centuries, Andrew's small church evolved into the Patriarchate of Constantinople. Because of its universally important position, it played a leading role in propagating the gospel of Christ in Asia, Africa, and Europe. It helped formulate the creeds and doctrines of early Christianity, and it helped to defend them in the face of continuous danger. For these contributions throughout the history of Christian faith, the Patriarchate of Constantinople came to be recognized by its sister Orthodox churches as first among equals, and is today revered by Orthodox Christians worldwide as the mother of all churches. The Bishop of Byzantium became the Patriarch, the father of the church in Constantinople, from the Greek Patriarchis, head of a patria, a family, a tribe, a race. In direct succession to the founder of the church, he is the Zosa Icon, the living icon of Saint Andrew. His All Holiness, the Archbishop of Constantinople, New Rome, and Ecumenical Patriarch. His is a spiritual leadership. He is not considered a legal or doctrinal superior like the Roman Catholic Pope. Rather, he is the most honored figure in a federation of independent churches that claim a unity of faith and order. His hegemony today is far less an actual jurisdiction of the Orthodox Patriarchates and autocephalous churches spanning the globe. His is a spiritual authority over matters of faith, morals, and ecclesiastic or canon law. He is elected and enthroned by the Holy Synod consisting of 12 metropolitans, the equivalent of a sacred college of the ecumenical patriarchate. He is the primate of the ecumenical throne and oversees the ecclesiastical district of Constantinople as his own diocese. Primus inter pares, the principal connecting link in the mosaic of world orthodoxy.
The fate of the ecumenical patriarchate has always been inextricably connected with the life of the city on the Bosporus. Through the years of growth and splendor, of hardship and decline, the two entities have shared the glory and the despair, the triumph and the persecution. They have even shared an emblem of old, the double-headed eagle, which once symbolized the reach of the empire from east to west and now stands for a reaching out of a different kind. After the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks in 1453 and the demise of the Byzantine state, the ecumenical patriarchate was given the responsibility of religious as well as political leadership of all Christians in the vast Ottoman Empire. This relationship with the Muslim authorities became a source of woes for the patriarchate. Yet, although its jurisdiction was restricted, the Church of Constantinople preserved the faith of Christianity, as well as the language and the national cohesion of all Christians under Ottoman rule. During that time, the Patriarchate was moved from the great Hagia Sophia edifice, first to the Church of the Twelve Apostles, then to the Pamakaristos, and then to St. Demetrius, as the previous sites were converted into Muslim mosques. In 1599, it came to the St. George Church complex in the Fanar section of the city, where it has been ever since. In 1941, a devastating fire totally destroyed a large section of the four-story central patriarchal building. The Church of St. George was spared, as was, amazingly, the small chapel of St. Andrew the Apostle. The humble and unassuming physical surroundings, a sanctum of peace in a clamoring city, offer nothing of the aesthetic splendor one might expect from the liturgical center of world orthodoxy. The Church of St. George brings to mind the Church of the Catacombs, when Christianity was more vigorous and holy, closer to God, and to the teachings and aspirations of his Son.
The austere church holds a holy relic that takes us back to the time of the Passion. On the southern wall, the pole of the flagellation is reverently preserved, on which the Son of God was tied and tortured before his crucifixion. Close by rest the sacred remains of three women saints, Ephemia, Solomoni, and Theophano. Strikingly moving in its simplicity, the Chapel of St. Andrew hosts liturgies for the pilgrims who visit from distant parts of the world. Until as late as the mid-1980s, numerous requests for the reconstruction of the patriarchal building were denied by the Turkish government, which cited the refusal of the Greek government on similar project requests by the Muslim minority in Greece. A building permit was issued only as late as 1987, following intensive negotiations among Archbishop Yakovos, primate of the Greek Orthodox Church in the Americas, former U.S. President Jimmy Carter, and Prime Minister Ozal of Turkey. The support of Orthodox faithful from around the world and an extraordinary single contribution by the Panayotis Angelopoulos family of Athens, Greece, finally helped realize the dream of reconstruction and the restoration to the ecumenical patriarchate of a modern, functional building. A symbolic event of immense significance, this milestone of reconstruction, of rebuilding, heralds and affirms the dawning of a new era of worldwide religious tolerance. It also affirms the astounding resilience of the ecumenical patriarchate and the legitimacy of its claim as the heart of Orthodox Christianity. Poised to receive the devout celebrants pouring in from the four corners of the world to rejoice in the dedication of the new edifice, the Fanar prepares to welcome them in jubilant festivity and subdued splendor. They are coming to Istanbul from the Greek Istinpolin, meaning to the city, Constantine's city, Constantinople. 
They are coming to visit that special universe that reigns in their hearts and minds with images and feelings of traditions unbroken, of a heritage conquered but not compromised. They are imbued not with nostalgia, but with gratitude for the journey, for the privilege of inheriting such a splendid legacy. They are here to tread the Justinian walls, meditate in the crumbling churches, have a moment of stillness in the Hagia Sophia. The Church of Hagia Sophia, in a way, represents the apogee of Byzantine imperial claim, if you wish. But at the same time, it gives us a kind of inkling into the idea of ecumenicity that the Byzantine emperor claimed for himself. And that our church inherits, that is to say, the Orthodox Church inherits from uh, the Byzantine dom period. Uh, and the, physically, the building itself is extremely imposing. It was certainly the largest building of its kind, the largest church by far, and probably the, one of the largest buildings built certainly until the 16th century when uh, Michelangelo built the whole uh, piazza and then the entire complex of St. Peter's. Uh, the church, as was mentioned, is over, has a dome that's over 200 feet high. Uh, it has, it was built against almost the law of physics, if you wish. Ideally, this building should not be standing. It took five years to complete the Hagia Sophia, or Church of Holy Wisdom, which was inaugurated in the year 537 AD. The use of revolutionary structural designs produced a magnificent example of a domed basilica that still overwhelms the visitor with a sense of his minuteness before his maker. Upon completion of the church, awed by the site, Justinian is said to have proclaimed, Solomon, I have outdone thee. No liturgy is heard today in this most impressive church of Orthodox Christianity. After the fall of Byzantium, Hagia Sophia was turned into a mosque and now serves as a museum. Next visit in the Pilgrim's Path, the Panagia of La Cherne, one of the most renowned churches dedicated to the Theotokos, the Mother of God. Dating back to the fifth century, it gained a special place in the hearts of the Byzantines in the year 626 AD. The Avars have laid siege to the city. Patriarch Sergius and the people of Constantinople see their last chance in their prayers for divine intervention. The icon of the Theotokos is carried in a procession around the fortress to encourage the soldiers and to invoke the help of the Mother of God. 
the Avars withdraw, Constantinople is spared, and its salvation is attributed to the Theotokos. The people of the imperial city come to the church in Vlaherne, where they hold a celebratory liturgy, expressing their amazement and gratitude for the miracle. They sing, for the first time ever, one of the most beautiful hymns of orthodoxy, the Akathist hymn, the hymn to be sung while standing, in salutation and praise of the Mother of God as the protectress of the city and its people. Orthodox Church, the Theotokos, holds a position of supreme importance. She is the foremost of the intercessors to God because of her special relationship with Christ. Her worship involves a great degree of emotion. She elicits veneration in every aspect of the life of the faithful. Her preeminent attribute is that of the life-giving fountain, the Zodokos Piyi. Dedicated to this eternal fountain of life is the church of Zolva Hospiyi in Balukli, dating back to the 6th century. Legend has it that the church was built by Justinian after he had a vision of a fountain of miracles. Situated outside the walls of the imperial city, the church was often the target of enemy armies during the numerous sieges of Constantinople. Several times it was rebuilt from its ashes so the faithful could continue to seek the assistance of the Mother of God. In witness to Justinian's vision, numerous miracles have been recorded, attesting to the healing of alien pilgrims. The church of Zolda Hospiyi also stands as a special memorial to the history of the Patriarchate. A long line of tombs commands its marble courtyard. They are the tombs of patriarchs who served the ecumenical throne and guided orthodoxy through the ages. Men who devoted their life to the preservation of Christian faith, Byzantine tradition and classical Greek thought. Many of them lost their lives for doing so. Such was the fate of Patriarch Gregorius V, who was hung at the gate of the Patriarchate victim of the Sultan's wrath after the eruption of the Greek revolt in 1821. The pilgrim recalls that even in times of adversity and persecution, the ecumenical patriarchate has been able to transcend its immediate hardship and dedicate itself to a greater mission. True to the meaning of its title ecumenical, meaning universal in Greek, the Patriarchate has always recognized that its character is supranational and that the Patriarch has spiritual responsibilities toward churches of all nations, as well as churches of all faiths. The Ecumenical Patriarchate, both in ancient times and in modern times, has played a fundamental role in giving impetus to the ecumenical movement, that is the bringing together of churches of different confessions into um, at least a desire and expression of the unity that all churches say that we have in Jesus Christ as the, as the people of God. It was 
His Holiness Joachim III, who in 1902 sent a letter to heads of local churches proposing the idea of a conference where there would be discussions about the possibility of coming together. In 1904, he reiterated those concerns. But in 1920, uh, His Holiness, uh, his, uh, the, the Ecumenical Patriarchate, sent then a letter addressed to all of the churches of the world in which it was proposed that there be a koinonia of churches, a fellowship of churches, or rather a league of churches formed in 1920. In 1948, the World Council of Churches was indeed formed. A kinonia, a fellowship, a league of churches manifesting their oneness in Christ. In 1948, a charismatic figure was elected to the ecumenical throne. Athenagoras' vision of reconciliation and ultimate reunification of Christian churches opened a new and historic chapter in inter-Orthodox and interfaith relations. Reflecting on Athenagoras, for many Christians, Muslims and Jews, is like a meditation. A fisher of men, a true shepherd, a prophet of reconciliation. His untiring efforts brought the Orthodox churches together in unprecedented congresses, setting agendas for future pan-Orthodox synods. Then he put his vision to the task. He met Pope Paul VI in Jerusalem in the first encounter of pontiff and patriarch in over 500 years. The mutual lifting of the thousand-year-old excommunications followed, and a few years later, Pope and the Patriarch knelt together in prayer in the Vatican before the crucified and resurrected Christ and exchanged the kiss of peace, attesting that only love can reign between the two churches founded by apostles and brothers Peter and Andrew. Today, the Zosa Icon of Andrew, Patriarch Demetrius I, and Peter's successor, Pope John Paul II, continue on this dialogue of love, looking to the day when all Christians may come together before a common chalice. His All Holiness, Demetrius I, and by the grace of God, Ecumenical Patriarch of Constantinople, the 269th successor of Apostle Andrew. A humble man of intense spirituality, he leads his world-dispersed flock at a time of universal political and religious change. A worthy steward of the throne, he too has journeyed to strengthen the bonds between the mother and sister churches of Orthodox Christianity. He too has journeyed to visit Protestant brethren. He too went to the Vatican for another precedent-shattering meeting with the Pope of Rome. The two churches came closer than ever when Patriarch and Pontiff, in a remarkable concelebration of the Liturgy of the Word, recited the Nicene Creed together in both Latin and Greek. In their homilies, they both asserted the will to take concrete action to remove all obstacles toward full Christian unity. The Orthodox churches and the Patriarchate have played that role. Helping, to, helping the churches throughout the world to understand how one relates deep senses of history, a profound understanding of spirituality to the pressing needs of the given moment, both action and reflection in intellectual and spiritual terms. I would say that has been, in many ways, the chief contribution of the Orthodox churches to the ecumenical movement. Lest the pilgrim forget, the ecumenical patriarch is not only the head of world orthodoxy, but also the archbishop of the church in Istanbul and Turkey, overseeing 68 parishes and several educational and philanthropic institutions which date back to the Byzantine times, and which define and preserve the identity of the patriarchate, along with the spirit and history of the Greek Orthodox community in Istanbul. Halki. The name elicits a powerful emotional response from the pilgrim. 
The theological school on this beautiful island on the Propontis has been a renowned educational center for over a century, graduating prominent individuals who went on to serve the Orthodox Church as prelates, clergymen, educators, and lay leaders. In 1971, however, the Turkish authorities prohibited the operation of such private schools and Halki had to close its doors. Today, the school remains closed and the treasures of a library that contains 100,000 rare books and codicils are accessible only to its caretakers. Halki is, for the Patriarchate, a very important pivotal point for continuation of orthodox tradition. It can assume that role once again. Most recently, thanks to much of the work of His Eminence Archbishop Yakovus, and through the Order of St. Andrew, the Archons, who have been visiting the Patriarchate and Chalki for the last eight years. Much is going on behind the scenes with the authorities there so that Chalki can once again open as an institution for higher learning. The Magali to Janus Scholi, the great school of the nation, is a direct successor of the famous Byzantine school and was reinstated after the fall of the city as a higher educational institute for the Greek community. The Megali to Janus Scholi. Centuries of history, of learning, of eminent individuals who went on to enrich the Greek diaspora. The 19th century, it provided trained leadership for the newly born Greek state. Still alive today, the Megali Scholi operates as a Greek minority high school. Throughout the history of the Byzantine Empire, the history of the Patriarchate, we have numerous institutions, hospitals, old age homes, orphanages, hospices, xenones, as well known, leprosaria, and so on and so forth. It seems to me that this really was one of the brighter aspects of Byzantine civilization, and we must remember that this philanthropic activity was under the auspices and the guidance of the Patriarchate, of the Church, even though many of the institutions were established by lay people. Now, as far as modern activity that is following the collapse of the Byzantine Empire as a state, again, it was the Patriarchate which became the spokesman, which became the protector, the heaven, really, of the people in need, uh, whether sick, poor, and this and that. Briefly, I can tell you that between uh, 1754 and 1795, the Patriarchate uh, guided uh, three important hospitals in the city of Constantinople, present-day Istanbul. One of them survives to the present day. At one time, this important institution, the Hospital of Alukli, was the most important hospital in the Balkan Peninsula, in the Balkans. To the present day, it offers its services to Christians, to Muslims, uh, to people of various ethnic, religious, and cultural background. Το νοσοκομείο είναι γενικό νοσοκομείο. Έχουμε τμήμα παθολογίας, έχουμε τμήμα χειρουργίας, έχουμε τμήμα... The hospital operates as a general hospital that includes a department of pathology, a department of surgery, a department of obstetrics, departments in urology, ophthalmology, a general surgery department, and a department of psychiatry. The hospital is a charitable institution. It has 650 beds, of which 250 belong to the old age home. Out of those 650 beds, 585 are entirely free of charge, totally free. The high operational cost of the institutions preserved and sustained by the Patriarchate is met by contributions of Orthodox faithful from around the world, who have always provided constant moral and financial support to the Fanar. 
For many years, the restoration of the Patriarchate's central building has been a goal of paramount importance for the Greek Orthodox communities worldwide. One of the most effective champions of the project has been the thriving Greek Orthodox community in the Americas. Under the guidance of His Eminence Archbishop Iakovos and through the leadership of the National Ladies Philopterus Society and the Archons of the Order of St. Andrew, substantial initial funding was secured to allow construction to begin. The high cost of the project, however, quickly absorbed these funds and the entire enterprise seemed to be in danger of postponement. The Patriarch was born in the 15th of the year ήταν μεγάλη εκδήλωση στην Μητρόπολη Αθηνών. Μετά το τέλος... The Patriarch visited Athens and there was a huge celebration in the Metropolitan Cathedral of Athens. After the ceremony, I visited the Patriarch at his hotel and I asked him, Your Holiness, what is happening with the building of the Ecumenical Patriarchate? I knew that there were monies coming from the United States, but he told me we did have money from the United States, but this money has run out, and for this reason we came to Greece to look for money or even form a committee that would go abroad for the same thing, but of course such a procedure would take a lot of time. At that very moment, I had not planned anything out. Immediately, though, you can call it inspiration or whatever you wish to call it, I thought maybe we can do something about it. My two children were in Switzerland. And that same night, I called them on the phone and told them of my thoughts of how we could help the Patriarchate. Indeed, the next day, they both arrived from Zurich to Athens. At about 7.30 at night, we went to the hotel, where we also met some of the members of the Holy Synod, who were accompanying the Patriarch on his trip to Athens. All three of us, I and my two children, we presented ourselves to the Patriarch and told him, Your Holiness, our family will undertake the reconstruction of this building in the fastest possible way, underwriting the total cost. It seems to me that Angelopoulos' family were the God-sent people that made this reconstruction possible and the new epoch for the ecumenical patriarchy and its activities, something which was prayed for and expected, but we had very little hope to achieve. Thanks to Mr. Angelopoulos, we have now the new patriarchate in Fanar, where all the administration offices have been located. <laughs> I'm satisfied with the fact that the whole operation began and finished on time. We were lucky enough to have Mr. Angelopoulos, who helped us immensely, and this reflects on the architecture of the building. If we had to hold collections every now and then for the reconstruction to go on, it might have taken us 10 years to finish. But thanks to Mr. Angelopoulos, the architect and contractors had the money they needed on time, every time. Because this building was classified as a preservable building, we had to abide by the regulations of the Archaeological Service of Istanbul. According to the classification they gave to our building, the exterior of the building should be an exact reproduction of the original, whereas inside they let us build as we pleased. Alas! 
Of course, the ecumenical patriarchate had its own strict requirements because there were several chambers of historical significance to the patriarchate, such as the Hall of the Mother of God, the Hall of the Patriarchs, the Hall of the Throne, and others. You must understand that we didn't have total freedom while we rebuilt, but this doesn't mean that the building isn't modern in its structure and its functions. Because the various buildings in the complex were not built at the same time, there were many things that had to be modified. For example, the roof of one building was taller than the roof next door. If you bring the roof lines at the same level, the buildings look more compact, like one unit. These kinds of aesthetic alterations I had to make to the original plans. We also had to alter the interior design of the building according to its type. Since the various buildings inside the complex were built in different stages, there were a lot of mistakes in them. For example, in the Hall of the Throne, they had designed a heavy Baroque ceiling, very heavy. Now, this shouldn't have been built. It was a mistake. Also, here you would have seen columns with ionic capitals. What does this building have to do with ionic capitals? I corrected these mistakes. I followed a principle that the interior should be harmonious to the exterior of the building. We even worked on the furniture. I sat down and designed the furniture. And we would have the furniture in a room matching with the doors and so on. Because I believe that when there is unity of form, there is beauty. The beauty and tranquility of the patriarchal compound betray larger forces at play than solely the talented labor of human hands. They are the imprints of a divine mission that spans nearly 2,000 years of unaltered resolve and spiritual exaltation. This unbroken tradition, this true faith, this orthodoxy is vividly alive on the morning of Sunday, the 17th of December in the year 1989. The pilgrims arrive early at the new patriarchal building where the dedication liturgy of the Thyranixia, the opening of the gates, is to be celebrated. Nine hundred official invitations have been issued, but many more faithful fill the patriarchal grounds, eager to be part of this momentous occasion. Long before the start of the Divine Liturgy, the Basilica of St. George and the entire courtyard are filled to capacity. Eminent patriarchs, metropolitans, bishops, clergy and laity represent the churches of world orthodoxy.
acts on behalf of all the Ukrainians, those who are in the communion with the Holy Ecumenical Patriarch, and those who will be. May I express the great joy that I have experienced here. I feel that this is a historical moment. I feel this is a renaissance of our Ecumenical Patriarchate. I feel that this is the moment when we start rebuilding what we have lost through the centuries, and I feel that this will be another point of juncture for all the Ukrainians and for all the Orthodox in the whole world. Government officials and dignitaries from Turkey, the United States and Greece are in attendance, as are representatives from the Vatican and other Christian churches. The religious leaders of the Muslim, Christian and Jewish faiths in Istanbul are also in attendance to affirm with their presence the universal human desire for religious tolerance and freedom. One would hope that this is indeed another of those symbols that parallels the falling down of walls and the opening of new possibilities throughout Eastern Europe. One might mention also the beginnings of the crumbling of different kinds of walls in places like South Africa. There is a sense where there is a, an opening for new possibilities in history. Let us pray then together that uh, the churches uh, have the, the strength and the courage and the wisdom and the community together correcting and assisting one another to take advantage of this new age and to prepare for uh, the breaking in of the kingdom, which we as Christians uh, await, where there will be a day of justice and a day of peace for all. Orthodoxy lives best in its worship. It is understood best as a community that glorifies God with the right worship, tinorthi doxa. Images, music, sounds, and scents engage the senses and assist the faithful to transcend the context of space and time. In Orthodox liturgy, the reenactment of the divine drama, all senses participate in the effort of man to commune with God. Time is indeed a transcendent for the congregation participating in this hierarchical divine liturgy. Officiating are the ecumenical patriarch Demetrius and the patriarch of Alexandria Parthenius, together with the archbishops of Czechoslovakia and Finland and other prelates of the ecumenical see. Time stands still. The senses soar.
On the same day that the Ecumenical Patriarchate celebrates the inauguration of its new building, it also expresses its feelings of esteem and gratitude toward Panayotis Angelopoulos, whose generous contribution has made the day possible. In a special service at the end of the Divine Liturgy, Angelopoulos is invested with the officium of Archon Megas Logothetis of the Great Church of Christ. This office, or distinction, dates back to the organization of the Byzantine Empire. The Ophician of Megas Logothetis was the highest among all governmental offices in Byzantium, and it would correspond to the contemporary title of Prime Minister. When the Byzantine imperial authority collapsed, the Church adopted these offices. For the Ecumenical Patriarchate, it is the highest honor to be bestowed on a lay person. Τα λόγια και η γραφή ποτέ δεν μπορούν να αποδώσουν εκείνα τα οποία αισθάνεται και έχει η καρδιά. Η καρδιά και η ψυχή πετούν σε ένα κόσμο Spoken words and words in print can never really express what the heart feels and has inside. The heart and the soul both fly in a world indefinite, inexplicable. A world beyond comprehension, undefinable. A world indescribable. Let me, however, try to express a few things from my heart. I wish that the two neighboring countries, Greece and Turkey, will share many more benefactors, not only in their material challenges, but especially in the spiritual ones, the ones that relate to the bonds of the two people, love, peace, joy, laughter, happiness, but above all, love, for love conquers all. Love, sincerity and truth set people free. I wish that benefactors like these with such virtues can be found between the two countries so that they can accomplish what for decades and centuries the people have longed for. For they are the ones who suffer, the people. The people who need to smile, to feel peace, to find themselves in a land of prosperity, full of spiritual and intellectual bliss. May God be with the two people, blessing them, gracing them, and keeping them in joy and happiness. May God be with you all. Today, the Ecumenical Patriarchate is very much alive, vigorous, visionary, and influential as never before in the last 500 years of its history. It has emerged transformed and renewed, having survived adversity and martyrdom, because it has been more than a brilliant tradition or a historic institution. It has been and continues to be an ideology, a mission, and an apostolate. 
It perseveres like a spark in the ashes which every so often breaks out and ignites a fire, providing both light and warmth not only to worldwide Orthodox Christianity, but to Christendom as a whole. It endures in the modern world, looking to the third millennium, guided by the principle of the ancient church as expressed by St. Augustine. Unity in necessary things, liberty in doubtful things, love in all things.